Hello everybody and welcome back to Geography 340 Climatology. I'm Dr. Zach Hilgendorf and in this video we're going to be talking about the third and final of our paleoclimate proxies that we're going to focus on for here. This is not in order of importance or record or anything. This is just the three that I, I was interested in, in sharing and, and teaching all of you. So this one is going to be lake cores and pollen records. So lake cores and pollen allow us to inform on past depositional climates and dominant plant types. And why is that important? Because it can tell us one, what type of plants existed uh, at a certain place at a given time in a different region. Uh, and depositional climates kind of tell us how much water is available to do geomorphic work. So if we know how much water is rushing across the surface that can inform on things like precipitation. And if we know how much precipitation there was, we can make different inferences on what the climate was like at the time. So the basis for pollen studies, so pollen grains can directly identify various plant species. Pollen is widely present and abundantly produced and pollen grains are quite resistant to decay. So if we look at A uh, and B and this figure from Chevalier et al in 2020, this is a new one. Uh, I'll have this available. It is a awesome paper uh, learning all about how paleo climate is reconstructed using pollen. Um, so on the top, we see fossil pollen records. On the bottom, we see pollen-based temperature reconstructions. Uh, so just to kind of give an idea of where we're using pollen most effectively to reconstruct past climates. Pollen studies, so uh, pollenology is the study of pollen. Pollen grains can be found in caves, lake sediments, soils, peat deposits, marine sediments, and glacial deposits. Pollen data provides information of changes in vegetation, climate, and human disturbance of terrestrial ecosystems. So we can use it for ergodic or space for time substitution. The principle of pollen-based reconstruction techniques we look down here is we look at our observed modern climate. We know what our climate is like right now. We look at the vegetation that is on our surface right now and we look and observe the pollen that's being distributed by that vegetation. If we can link it with predecessor species or plants of a similar type in time, we're able to push that record back. So if we can do things like carbon dating or other forms of dating where we know how old that was or how old the pollen was, we can look at what plants were on the surface at that time. If we know what plants were on the surface at that time, we can make some pretty safe inferences on what the climate must have been like at the time those plants were growing. Pollen production is inversely proportionate to the probability of fertilization. So if you look at uh, autogamous plants, self-fertilizing plants, uh, more than or less than if you were looking at an uh, entomophilous plant, insect fertilizing, or uh, anemophilous plants, so wind uh, dispersed pollen. Pollen can be produced during different seasons by different plants. Uh, so we ask how representative are pollen grains of species distribution and abundance? Well, look here, uh, the pollen production by uh, grain per flower, and then the rate of fall or their settling velocity, by and large, uh, pinus, pine trees, coniferous trees, produce a ton of it. <laughs> so and it's got a relatively fast fall velocity. So two centimeter, or, uh, sorry, slow fall velocity. So two centimeters per second, meaning that can su stay suspended and be distributed widely uh, compared to other different types of trees. Um, we can kind of get an idea for how pollen can be distributed by dominant species. Pollen production is species specific, whereas some plants can produce 70,000 grains per anther, others can only produce up to 100 grains per anther. Uh, we can see a couple examples of what those pollen grains look like on the right hand side here. So the pollen record is biased towards wind pollinated plants. So all gymnosperms and most angiosperms, because these plants need to produce vast qualities of pollen to try and fertilize their offspring of other species, or I'm sorry, of, of, sorry other members of their population elsewhere. So you have to flood the air with this pollen in order to effectively procreate. Uh, anemophilous plants or wind pollinated plants produce light aerodynamically shaped pollen, which is perfect for being distributed by the wind. Pollen deposition depends on grain shape and weight, wind velocity, wind direction, and canopy cover. So 
if we know how far from an epicenter these grains are being distributed, we can also make some inferences on what the wind climate must have been like at that time. So pollen dispersal, uh, travel distance is inversely proportionate to pollen grain size. Pollen grains are filtered as they move through the canopy. Some light pollen grains can be transported long distances in the upper atmosphere. In general, pollen from low standing plants have a low probability of dispersal. They're not up near the tops of trees, for example, where the atmospheric boundary layer is starting to redevelop. It's not being dragged by this vegetation as much, so it's gonna be more effective at transporting pollen away from the epicenter. This is another figure from that Chevalier et al. 2020 paper, just kind of showing uh, if you have large trees or aspen or pine, the wind is blowing right to left, for example, in this example, uh, we can see how they are being distributed across this surface, or maybe they're falling into a lake. Really important, because we wanna know about lake cores. Uh, so as they fall out into this lake, they settle down, are buried in sediment, and as they're buried in sediment, they're which is also has an annual cycle. Um, if you think about it, not much water is moving across the surface during the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere here because it's all locked up by snow and ice. So precipitation, which predominates during the uh, spring and summer months are records of that erosional signature across the surface um, and of you know, things like spring snow melt. So as the pollen is uh, added to the system, it's getting buried and you see these sediment varves. So kind of like with the ice cores, right? You have these varves or these layers of annual uh, preservation that are there unless you know something was to happen and erode that out. Um, but at the bottom of these bigger lakes, it's kind of tougher to do that. So you can have this record of uh, annual distribution and, and uh, deposition of sediment and pollen. So here we can look, uh, they can be recording local vegetation if you're in a pond or maybe regional vegetation if you're in a bigger lake because there's more surface area there's more depositional potential so that left photo is from uh, the door county region of uh, wisconsin that was taken by my wife uh, the photo on the right that's the uh, uh, devil's lake down near the baraboo Wis uh, wisconsin dells area that was taken by my dad so um, some uh, family uh, entries here so Things like Devil's Lake, which has been there uh, since the last glacial maximum, uh, can record a lengthy record of pollen and sediment uh, deposition. So surface pollen composition is different than vegetation composition and abundance. Pollen composition at a given point within an ecosystem is pretty consistent, but pollen composition at different sites within the same ecosystem are very or slightly at least different. The difference between pollen composition among sites in different ecosystems is far greater than the difference between sites within a single ecosystem. Think of uh, kind of our first law of geography, right? Things that are nearer are more alike than things that are farther apart. So as you uh, extend out from that epicenter and you get into another ecosystem, it's gonna be a vastly different uh, pollen composition than it would be here. So if I'm looking at pollen in Eau Claire versus pollen in Janesville, Wisconsin, or uh, Mankato, Minnesota. They're going to be different than, you know, because we're in a different ecosystem um, than here in Eau Claire. So for pollen analysis, analysis, sediment is collected in these kind of cores that you see here, this floating tube or raft. Uh, pollen grains are isolated from the sediment matrix via chemical treatments. And then isolated pollen grains are mounted onto a glass slide and are identified and quantified under a microscope. Here's an example of what one of those slides look like. We're looking at three different types of pollen here. So pollen counts in each slide are reported in percentage of the total pollen count, excluding wetland or rare species. Changes in the percentage of one species are interpreted to reflect a similar change in the composition of vegetation. So if you've got uh, a basically continuous tray of or slide of coniferous plants and then you see pollen from hardwood or deciduous plants coming, well, that can infer a lot on what temperatures are like at the time of deposition because if you have more deciduous coming in, might have warmer climates starting to invade into this region for a prolonged period of time, allowing the deciduous trees to beat out the coniferous trees 
problem. The percentage of pollen counts can give unrealistic information of vegetation composition if, for example, or for instance, a plant species is replaced by an abundantly pollen producing plant. So if you have, for example, a hazel tree uh, coming in or a pine tree moving in, um, that can kind of flood the system in some cases. To circumvent biases associated with pollen production, one could use pollen flux density values or pollen grains per year centimeter squared. However, accurate and numerous dates are needed because this is rare. Uh, pollen fluxes are not very often used. So looking at pollen interpretation, pollen diagrams are usually divided into zones to facilitate interpretation. Changes in pollen compositions are interpreted to indicate changes in climate or in human disturbance. So this is uh, a pollen graph by Match 1976 out of St. Paul, Minnesota. So looking at depth on the vertical axis in meters, so zero to 10 meters down, dated from uh, 10,230 years before the present all the way to the present. Uh, and what we see here is in the way past when temperatures were much colder, pine and or spruce trees predominated. Uh, and as we move towards the warmer mid Holocene, uh, we're getting to more of our oak savanna starting to invade uh, the area. We can see that here. Two general interpretive or interpretative approaches exist. The individualistic approach, so past climate uh, conditions are reconstructed on the basis of present day ecology and environmental tolerance of, and optima of plant species or the assemblage approach where past environmental conditions are reconstructed on the basis of modern plant associations in climate and biogeographical regions. The individualistic approach is kind of what we do in the Midwest a lot of times. Uh, we see a decline in hardwood species, beech, may, maple, oak, hickory, uh, and or an increase in conifer species like spruce, fir, or pine. That typically indicates cooling, right? There are colder climates uh, during you know, glaciation or the last glacial maximum right there, we're seeing it pretty uh, prevalent. And then we see this influx of hardwood species until we get here where oak predominated in the uh, kind of mid to late Holocene. Increases in ash and or elm trees indicate wet environments prevailing. Uh, decline in trees and an increase in grasses indicates drier, more arid climate conditions. Pollen interpretation, you have transfer functions, so a polynomial equation is fitted to observe the pollen data. It's not often used because these functions assume that only one parameter controls the distribution of vegetation, pollen. Uh, and this is particularly problematic for ecosystems with no modern analogs. We look at things like macro fossils, so plant remains, leaf, leaves, fruits, flowers, roots, etc., cetera, uh, are preserved in some particular environments like swamps, an advantage of this is species can readily be identified, providing good radiocarbon dates. A disadvantage, few locations are available and modern analogs are pretty difficult to establish. For tree line or ecotone regions, we see this gradual transition from mature dense forests through open discontinuous woodlands uh, to isolated trees and or grasslands. If this was transitioning to an Arctic or uh, ecotone, a more glaciated one, a boreal forest or tundra, we'd see, uh, we could use plant macrofossils that are collected from soils, soil type changes as vegetation changes, tree line coinciding with July temperatures, and then tree lines uh, also coinciding with mean summer positions of the Arctic front. Caveats, uh, there's a few. Uh, trees invade grasslands at a faster pace than grasses colonize forests. Uh, trees live longer than grasses, but grasses grow much faster. Fire frequency affects the tree line. The invasion of new species can be a problem. Records are usually incomplete. Um, are modern tree lines at equilibrium? That's tough to say. And what's the lag time for all of these things to be recorded in the record? That's a little bit tougher to tell. So pollen data can be problematic, but can also be a really useful tool for us to better understand these past paleoclimates and the distribution and cover of vegetation on our surface. I invite you to look and read through this uh, pollen-based climate reconstruction techniques for late quaternary studies. This is that Chevalier paper, a fascinating study to read through. And that's gonna wrap up our talk on paleoclimate records for now. Next week, we're going into uh, the contemporary and modern climate. So what are we doing? Where are we at? Uh, 
and where are we going? So I will see you in the next video and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.